All right, so welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you to do a whirlwind tour of user experience techniques. Um, I am Laura Quinn. I am a independent consultant um, specializing in research, so both um, user experience type research and evaluation type research for access to justice technologies. Um, many of you may know me from my prior life as executive director of Idealware. Um, in which I also work with a lot of uh, legal aid organizations um, and, uh, and other access to justice organizations. So I've been excited to bring kind of a lot of different um, pathways in my life together to specialize specifically in access to justice. And with me today, I have two folks who are going to both be, um, they're going to be presenting case studies as we get towards the end. And they're also going to be doing uh, what we call, we're calling color commentary. Um, so they're going to be uh, joining in to um, provide a, um, uh, a little bit of additional insight on it, so it's not just a wall of me talking to you. Um, so we have with us uh, Rachel Harris. Rachel, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, Laura. Uh, my name is Rachel Harris. Um, I work at the Ohio Legal Assistance Foundation. We are the state funder for uh, Ohio's legal aid. Um, I am the project coordinator for our Ohio Legal Help Project, which is our uh, statewide portal project. Um, and we have been working with Laura, um, especially over the past six months, doing a lot of user testing in anticipation of um, the development of that project. Um, and I'm really excited to share some of uh, what I've learned uh, with you all today. Fantastic. And we have also with us Dan Jackson from the New, La the new Law Lab. Dan, want to introduce yourself? Hi there, everybody. Dan Jackson. I'm the executive director of the New Law Lab. We are an interdisciplinary innovation laboratory at Northeastern University School of Law. We've been around for about five years. One of the things we've been doing in those five years is working with some legal aid organizations among this community on some of the tech tools for self-represented litigants. I think folks might be familiar with our game, Represent, two games now, Represent and Represent Renter, and that was with Connecticut, uh, Statewide Legal Services of Connecticut. We also uh, collaborated with Pine Tree, Pine Tree Legal Assistance of Maine on their state side legal initiative. Thrilled to be here. Fantastic. Great. All right, so what are we planning to cover today? Um, so we'll start with just a quick introduction to what user experience is. It's kind of a jargony term, but I like it because it kind of captures an important essence of, of what we're thinking about today. Um, and then we'll be thinking about it in kind of three categories. Defining your audience, uh, understanding how they view the world, and then getting their reaction. So thinking, and these blends a little bit, you know, they're not pristinely distinct categories. But we'll be thinking about how, what techniques we can use to do those three things, and then also outputs so that we can share that, those findings with others. And we'll be winding up with uh, two case studies, as we talked about, to kind of show how these actually come out into the world, which is often a combination of things. Um, and throughout, we'll be focusing on uh, fairly affordable ways to do things. Um, so assuming you don't have an enormous budget uh, or a ton of time and money, what are the important things to keep in mind here? So I really do want to pause here. It's going to be a little interesting. I, I hope you'll help me out. Um, sorry. Uh, I do want to pause here to ask you um, what it is that is particularly interest, interesting to you here. So if you'll take a minute to enter something into the questions pane um, that is, you know, kind of a question that you have or one of these that seem particularly interesting. Um, and then I'll ask, uh, sorry, if you can read some out to me or the themes, that type of stuff. I'd love to get a sense as to where people's mind is at. We'll test your multitasking uh, by starting to read while some of you are still typing. I'm going to just pause and let you type. <laughs> Ooh, I actually got the questions panel going again. <laughs> Most of the questions so far have been just uh, me helping people out with audio. Okay. But, oh, come on, guys. You can't, you can't um, leave me hanging here. I'm, in, Sorry, I'm interested in the uh, on-the-ground um, logistics of UX testing. 
um, how to do it with limited staff and budget. Fantastic. Um, evaluation techniques for self-help portals. Great. I'm just going to like just pause here until more people uh, give you some input here. All right. Yeah, we've got uh, somebody from the Massachusetts Tribal Courts here um, who is interested in um, how you are getting reactions from desired audiences. Mm, great. Great. Perfect. Um, thanks, guys. Certainly feel free if you're still typing, um, enter it in and we'll, we'll uh, capture it. Um, yeah, I, so it's great to know kind of what you're interested in covering. So perfect. Let's dive in here. So what is user experience? So I'm using the term user experience, which by the way is, is often abbreviated UX. So if you see UX, that's what it refers to. And the sum total of your audience's interaction. And because we're talking about technology specifically, it would be the sum total of, your, of the interaction with your technology. But for some, like if you're thinking about it for your organization, you could think about the user experience with your organization. And that would be all of the different ways that they can connect with you, you know, how the conversations that they have with your lawyers and how they feel about those. Um, so and for, for it to be a great user experience, I really like this definition. It should meet the exact needs of the customer without fuss or bother. And that sounds like a really simple definition until you really start to think about it. So it implies we need to know who the customer is, number one. And customer, I think we can also, we can say, you know, constituent, consumer, you know, whatever word we want to use there for um, a someone who would be accessing access to justice stuff. Um, so we need to know who they are, the audience is. We need to know their exact needs. And that is certainly, I mean, I honestly will never know their exact needs, but we can get as close as possible. And we need to be able to figure out what is going to meet them with, by their definition, without fuss or bother. Um, so it's actually a fairly powerful definition, I think, of what it is that we're trying to do. Um, and the main technique, or one of the main techniques you have to get there is to learning from those in the audience. So basically we think about ourselves as apprentices to actual individuals in our audience who know far better than we do what it is that they need, what it is that they do. Um, that's not to say, as we'll talk a considerable amount about, that's not to say that if we ask them, what do you need, they will be able to articulate that well, but they certainly, the information about what they do and what they would use is much more in, it's more in their head than it is in yours. Yeah, there's another good uh, one here, which is, um, do you ask users if they had success in their uh, court using law health resources? How do you, you measure success for users? Kind of the difference between user experience and judging um, outcomes. Fantastic. Or, interacting with those two? Yeah, I will. Uh, in fact, that's a great question that I, I didn't actually um, have anything to cover, but I'll, I'll put that in as we talk about getting people's reactions, um, kind of the idea of reactions and success. Absolutely. All right, so we're gonna think it through in three parts as we talked about. So thinking about who's in your audience, um, so what are their characteristics? So kind of some basic definition of your audience. We'll then go, if the ways, we'll think about ways to dive deeper. How does the audience currently do what you are planning to support? They do it somehow, even if it's, you know, by, I don't know, talking to their barber or, you know, filling it out in paper or, you know, it, it, there, there is some method by which they are at least attempting to accomplish what you are doing. And, and how they think about it, which can often be very different about how we as you know, experienced technologists or lawyers or both are thinking about it. And then getting their reaction. So basically, so we're understanding how they view the world before we necessarily have anything to put in front of them for them to react to. But then it's also very useful to put things, so uh, our own, 
a design for a technology system, uh, somebody else's design for a technology system, an actual working system, whatever, in front of them to um, get their thoughts. So we'll talk through that. All right, so let's start with defining your audience. Um, with the idea that there are many, many audiences that you could define. So the idea of the dartboard here is not that we're just throwing darts to find your audience, but that each of these, you know, we've got all of these the different segments and there's overlap and there, this is often a really complicated thing to think about as to who your audience is. So in this realm, we're thinking specifically about who the target audience is, how many people are in that, so we know whether we're designing for a very limited audience, a big audience, and kind of what the difference between those are. Things like their literacy level, their tech proficiency, general trends of their needs. So we're going to, in the next section, talk more about kind of their, much more about their, how we would understand their needs. But we're going to go through each of these in more detail. But we're going to talk about quick conversations with subject matter experts. Sorry for my abbreviation here, SMEs. Talk about review of existing research, surveys of target audience, creation of personas. Um, so basically a bunch of different ways that you could understand who is out there. So you want to start simply with the, the thought process which can really be instructive and, and provide a lot of guidance for you, simply by saying, okay, who specifically is our audience? What is the defining characteristics that define them as your audience? And who isn't in that? And if we have a number of audiences, which is often, often true, how can we prioritize them? So basically starting to say, all right, everyone is not a target audience. Also low-income people in Ohio is not a, a really a feasible to work with target audience. We need more specific parameters than that in order to really be able to start to think about who we're working with. Dan, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot. Do you have, as you've been uh, working on, you know, kind of all of the different projects you've been doing, uh, have you any, do you have any specific techniques that you've used to just to start to think about how to crystallize out what audience you're even going to, you know, talk to, test with? Oh, well, yeah, it very much depends on the project or the problem that we're trying to solve. I mean, we're, our work really is uh, focused on working directly with intended end users, so it's co-design and uh, other ways of working directly with the you know, folks uh, for whom we're designing. Um, and so that in that instance, of course, uh, the users already 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 defined. Um, and so it's very much based on the on the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, mm -hmm. For you know, when I when we worked with uh, statewide legal services of Connecticut, we had self-represented litigants. Obviously, was the chief um, target audience, and so we worked directly with those folks in designing the game itself. But there's of course lots of different you know uh, subsets of individuals within those categories. But we let that process, we let those folks to sort of define that themselves. We tend to uh, err on the side of uh, giving our users the tools to uh, direct the process. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So basically, a uh, so starting to think about this as simply a more complicated than it might seem. Like so, so to assume that you may have some questions about as well as answers about who your audiences are that you'll want to explore through your further research. Speaking of research, um, thinking about academic research. Um, we are lucky in the legal aid world, in the access to justice world, in that there is, in fact, often academic research that overlaps with topic areas that we're interested in or the target demographics that we're interested in. Um, so if we are, for instance, you know, I just I, I heard Sartre mention that there's someone on the call who works with First Nations tribes, understanding how, you know, First Nations folks think about access to justice or they think about uh, what it means to get a fair day in court. You know, I have no idea whether those studies have been done, but it wouldn't surprise me. And that would be really informative 
in that type of, of uh, work. If we're doing uh, technology work to target uh, an audience like that. Um, so thinking through demographics, characteristics, uh, including like as you just try to get your hands around it, understanding what other people thought was important to understand is can be really useful and some key themes. So I've just pulled a couple of things that I knew existed um, just to uh, give you the uh, examples of the types of things that do exist. Um, there's a very big piece of research um, that uh, pulls together eviction statistics um, that has a really nifty site called the Eviction Lab. Um, and there's a bunch of um, uh, research and trends um, drawn off this data. Um, the um, uh, IELTS, the um, out of the University of Denver, I believe, um, did a uh, research on, on experiences of self-representation in the U.S. Family Court, which is a fantastic report. Um, I've just pulled, I was thinking about disasters uh, for a different project I was doing, and I'm like, well, I bet there's stuff for, you know, about, you know, how we help people who are in the midst of disasters. Did a Google search, and, you know, two minutes later, I have this report that would be a really interesting piece of this. So basically, the, uh, the idea being that these are resources that really are often much more useful than it feels like, I, I kind of feel like they're, people assume they're not going to be valuable when in fact I find that certainly at least as background reading if nothing else they are are more likely to be useful than not um, and, and we'll talk about um, some ways to use that in a second. Analytics data um, so this is something that um, most technology people on the, on the call are probably um, uh, familiar with from potentially a different perspective um, so thinking through um, what things like your Google Analytics on your or somebody else's website can tell you. Um, social media sites also can tell you things like age and gender, can tell you what topic areas are of interest to people, can tell you how they tend to navigate through websites, uh, things like that. And with our, us being a very close-knit community in the Access, Justice, the Access to Justice community, keeping in mind that often people are willing to share. Um, so if you have somebody else who has um, a website that seems like it might be targeted at a similar demographic, similar audience, to say, you know, well, maybe they would, would be willing to, to tell us some of this information about their own website um, to the extent that it's useful for us. So it, we're going to talk a lot in the next section about interviews with target audience members, focus groups, uh, things like that, um, which would be certainly my preferred method. But if budget does not allow for that, just simply talking to people who are out in the field, so line staff who work directly with your target audience, can be really helpful. So. It's so both in a legal aid context, so this would might be like talking to your lawyers who are actually um, working with you or directly with your constituents, uh, but then also saying, all right, well, we're interested in, you know, thinking about issues of housing. Well, let's go talk to some people working in a homeless shelter about what are the typical issues they're seeing that have gotten people there in, initially or are preventing them from getting back in housing or you know that type of thing so to understand to sort of think through if we can't if we don't have the money to go talk to you know a bunch of people uh of direct uh, sorry a, a bunch of people who are actually in our audience um we can at least go talk to people who have directly interacted with a bunch of people who are in our audience um to try to get um viewpoints there um and you want to do at least three to four people. So in general, um, as you're thinking about interviews, um, so one is not enough because you can have uh, just a really weirdly, you know, skewed perspective. Two, you have the potential that people really disagree with each other and then you don't really know where to take it. Uh, three starts to be, you could start to build up some themes. 
four is, you know, then you can begin to feel what's okay. Everybody, all four people said this. This is really important. Um, this is only one person said this, and it seems pretty far afield. That's we don't need to care as much about that. First, conversations with subject matter experts. Um, Dan or Rachel, I feel like, sorry, I feel like I'm talking a lot, so I'm hoping that one of you, anything to, to kind of add on the idea of um, the, the possibility of talking to or including kind of uh, subject matter experts, either in addition to or opposed to, myself? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so this is Rachel. Um, yeah, so I think another, um, element of this that was very helpful for us in our user testing was we uh, started out our project with some quick conversations with subject matter experts um, both in our legal aid organizations but also in um, other community organizations, um, community development corporations, and um, community action agencies which administer um, certain uh, public benefits in Ohio. And that actually ended up being a um, great connection to have established later on when we were looking at our user testing um, and looking at locations to do our user testing. And um, I, looking back on it now, we realized that that really gave us a great opportunity to um, kind of start looping others in on our project. Um, so it kind of had double value. Um, and it was It was very great. And the only thing I would add to that is um, be respectful of your subject matter experts' time, and therefore, uh, you know, schedule that opportunity to speak with them at the right point in your project, so that the ideas are starting to come together in such a way that you're actually going to be able to have a real focused conversation. It's not always helpful to have real uh, meandering uh, and vague conversations uh, early on in the in the process with a subject matter expert because they may not have anything to add value there. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, so I would say certainly have a focused conversation, no question. So have a focused list of questions, and we'll talk more about this as we get to interviews. Um, I would say that it doesn't necessarily need to be later in the project process, from my perspective, because we might ask them um, really focused questions like, for instance, um, what are the, uh, so I'm just trying to think of an actual example of a, of a technology, let's say we're building a, um, a volunteer portal for um, lawyers, and so we go talk to, um, so the obvious line staff would be the people who are working with the lawyers, so what are the, what are the most typical obstacles you see to people actually, from, so someone has expressed interest what are the most typical obstacles that keep them from actually doing something? You know, that's a very focused question, but it's very early on before you've actually defined precisely what the project is. So, absolutely. Great. Um, surveys. Surveys are really interesting. I feel like people often go to, or I think surveys are people's go-to for getting information on what people want or need. Um, and I feel like they're, they're definitely a useful way to get answers to a few questions from a lot of people. They will get you shallow information, but very broad information. However, they're harder than you might think, especially to get reliable information. Um, so unless your group is very discreet, so unless you can fairly easily define everybody who is in it and have some reason to expect that you can get a fair number of them to answer your survey, it's hard to get a sample that actually, it's hard to get the, the right people to answer the survey, or not the right people, but a, uh, the, a selection of people to answer the survey that actually you can have some confidence is not skewed in some weird way. Um, so basically, unless you can define why it's not skewed in some weird way, you need to assume it probably is. <laughs> so you can say that, all right, well, this is interesting information that is, um, can guide us, but unless you've actually talked to someone, hired somebody about getting a representative sample, which that typically takes time and money, um, you're going to have to assume that it's, you know, uh, that it's going to be for guidance only. 
and they need to be written carefully as well. Um, so the questions need to be carefully done in order to not sway the audience. So, so in fact, the further I go in my career, uh, the less I tend to like surveys as a quick and easy research technique. Um, particularly, I think, because they seem quick and easy, um, but they don't give you data that is really easily actionable. So personally, I would almost always go talk to five people, um, then survey, you know, a broad-based group of people and just kind of see what happens. Um, because mostly because that broad based piece of group of people will not give me a lot of survey results and I won't know what to make of it when it happens. Does anybody want to disagree with that? That's actually a fairly controversial opinion. Anybody through the chat have different experiences or Rachel or Dan um, want to um, want to disagree with me? So I, I think um, I, I strongly agree that surveys have some challenges and it's even a different, there's an additional set of challenges. Um, when doing user testing on uh, web resources or other things, um, watching someone interact with something versus self-reporting afterwards can be fundamentally different. We are not the best at reporting on ourselves. We're, also, we're often a bit self-conscious and tend to try to defend our ego when filling out a survey. Uh, so watching someone and having that actual user interaction where you see them interact, you're going to get a much more honest, unbiased uh, understanding of how your resource works. Yep. Right. Totally agree there. I totally agree with that. Great. Perfect. All right, let's talk about some ways to actually, um, so we've gathered information about our audience. What are some ways to put it out in the world in a way that um, that people can uh, can kind of process it so it's not just a bunch of data. One of the ways that I've found to be most useful is a topic that's, or a, um, a technique that's called personas, or is this technically personae, if you want to get really technical, because persona is a Latin name and the, and the plural would be personae. Um, anyway, um, so, um, so this is basically, we've got a, a fictitious person um, who's serving as kind of an archetype uh, for us to be able to focus our uh, kind of it, our design energies around. Because it's a lot easier to think about how we would support, you know, Susan, who is a supportive social worker, um, than it is to kind of think through the general idea of how social workers want to use the site. So we can say, what do we, would, would Susan like this site? You know, and I'm, I'm sorry, we, we wouldn't say that. We would say, would Susan use this particular feature? You know, what would Susan do here? Uh, so the reason I just backed out of would Susan like this site is because we tend to, as, as Sartre just kind of mentioned briefly, uh, we try to stay away in user experience from the idea of what people actually like in favor of what they actually do or use because people will often self-report that they like something that does not actually save them time or increase their understanding or lead to any actionable goal. This, what we're looking at here is a, so this is from Illinois. Um, it is using a template that you can easily find online. Um, if you just search on persona template, um, you will find this template um, that um, kind of, uh, Think, uh, helps you to think through, all right, here's, I'm going to just kind of plug in, all right, here's her goals potentially, or sorry, her motivations. So these, this reads, uh, empower clients, close cases, receive recognition, um, a bunch of goals, challenges. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is one that we used for Ohio Legal Help. Um, I um, I kind of like so the the that prefer, that particular template we were just looking at uh, for me it has a little too much information I kind of like a narrative instead because it allows you to kind of cut to the chase a little more quickly um, and um, uh, yeah and so you can see like for instance in this particular case uh, we also sliced the personas somewhat differently um, we've got Matthew watching the big picture. We also had um, somebody who just wanted quick answers, and we had someone who really wanted uh, wanted support, wanted someone to tell her the answer. 
Um, but things to include in these are context, so we can really feel like we can get to know uh, our persona a little bit, um, how he's accessing it. So for instance, Matthew here, he doesn't, doesn't have a computer or a smartphone, but he uses the library of the computer. Doesn't use the internet a lot for every little thing, but he can generally get by when he needs to use it. And one, it basically his defining characteristic is he wants to understand all the options. Um, but like, in fact, all of our personas for this, he has little knowledge of legal terms or potential courses of action, not a lot of experience with researching things. Um, so these are the things to include to um, help make that useful. Questions or thoughts about kind of this whole idea of defining your audience before we look a little bit at understanding how they view the world. This is Dan. I would just throw out here that um, always include some extreme users uh, in your portfolio of personas because uh, that's um, that's a great way to make sure that whatever you're developing is going to be able to hit all of the needs of all the fast, you know, all the different folks out there with very different needs. The extreme users are sometimes the ones who are um, most likely to break it, and therefore you want to have that in mind. Yeah, yeah. And there's actually lots of schools of thoughts about this. There's actually there's we could probably do a whole session on personas uh, because one there's a school of thought that says you might want to focus in only on like one or two extreme users, particularly if they can, if they seem like they encompass other folks. Um, so to say, all right, well, the folk, the, the, you know, the person who is not very literate, who is using it on a phone, who wants to understand every option, conceivably, and, and this is going to be entirely dependent on the project, but conceivably that might um, uh, encompass a lot of other personas and we can laser focus on that one, which would be really handy if we can. All right, let's dive, let's think about diving a little deeper into understanding how they view the world. I've purposely got this. This is a upside down map from the, the perspective of Australia. Um, so thinking about this, you know, this is often kind of what we learn when we talk to people on the ground. Like the facts are the same, but they're perceived in such a different way to not really be possibly even that recognizable. Um, and so it can often be really transformational to go talk to uh, real users and, uh, and get real people involved um, uh, in, in your research and your project. So here's some key things that we're going to, that you'd want to look at here. So what would motivate them to use the system? So you want to think through their motivations in general and their motivations around the system. So what are their goals? I think it's easy for us to focus in on our own goals, um, but fundamentally, if our goals don't overset, intersect with their goals, then it, it doesn't matter, you know, because they're not going to want to use the system. And how, does, how do they currently achieve their goals? So they have a goal. Like, let's say their goal is to understand how to get a divorce, um, and they are achieving it in some way, even if that's going to talk to their cousin Larry, who really has no idea about how to get a divorce and gives terrible advice. They are achieving the goal of understanding this. I mean, they're not understand, it's not a correct understanding, but they feel they've accomplished it. So it's a really important to think through their current processes and understanding kind of how they think about those related processes and what works well and what are the gaps. Um, some of the same things that we just talked about um, will, would work here. If nothing else, quick conversations with people who actually work with folks on the ground. Um, so you'll, you'll hear the theme throughout. So best to talk to the real audience. If you can't talk to the real audience, at least go talk to people who work with the real audience. Existing research can be really useful. We'll talk here about interviews, focus groups, surveys are again uh, interesting, and we'll talk about documenting these through mental models or process flows. Interviews. So 
this is a great way to understand context. This is probably, this is my, honestly, my go-to as a researcher um, at the beginning of a project to kind of understand what it is that, um, how it is that people are thinking and to establish kind of the overall context for whatever it is that I'm investigating. So you want to write out what questions you'll ask. And as Dan mentioned before, you definitely don't want to make it feel like a fishing expedition. You want to make it feel like you are asking questions that they will know the answer to. <laughs> so it's not just a general, there's three questions in a half hour interview. It's more like there are, I don't know, 15 questions or 10 questions in a half hour interview. Um, you want to write them out, but you don't want to actually read them uh, verbatim to sound really scripted. You want to make it a conversation. We're going to start with easy questions. Um, so don't start with, you know, a really world changing question. Almost anybody that you talk to will say that they don't know enough about whatever you're asking them about to offer an opinion. Um, it, it, strangely enough, actually, though, I find the more experts they are in that particular area, uh, the more likely they are to tell you that they don't actually know anything about it. Um, and it's certainly true if you're going out to talk to uh, members of your target audience um, that you want to start by thinking about making them comfortable, establishing, you know, a bit of a rapport to make yourself not uh, seem approachable and not um, uh, kind of in an ivory tower. Um, and I actually find re a really helpful mental model for this for myself is thinking of myself as their apprentice to understand what they think and do. And certainly no one understands what they think and do better than they do. Um, and so, and that is all I'm there to do, is understand what they think and do. Um, so uh, that may or may not be helpful to you, but it's always been helpful to me. And again, three to four people for each demographic you care about. Um, this can actually get fairly complicated fairly fast, because if we say, all right, and we feel like we care about both people who are living in urban areas and people in suburban and in rural, and we care about high-tech literacy and low-tech literacy. Um, this tends to, uh, you te the typical way to do that is to form a matrix of uh, kind of thinking through, all right, about how many people would that be, and either carefully or approximately um, trying to segment. Dan, Rachel, any thoughts on interviews? Um, so in terms of starting with easy questions, uh, that was uh, when we were doing our user testing. One thing that I wish we had thought about um, when we were writing our script is we did start with what we thought was an easy question, which was uh, what do you do? And we were testing with um, low income users and many of them were not employed and we quickly realized that that was just totally off-putting and not a, a pleasant way to start a conversation. Um, and so we altered that a few interviews into, you know, who do you live with? Like, what's your family like? And that was much more effective and um, much more conversational. Um, so just thinking about the, you know, cultural context that you're in when you're doing your interviews um, is something I wish I had known. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nope. Yeah, the only thing I would add on that is, you know, interview questions, it's a tricky balance because you have to be detailed enough to get what you need. But at the same time, if you're too focused, you're going to miss out on a lot of potentially uh, valuable information. Um, you know, especially for lawyer designers, I think we can sometimes get a little bit too detailed and it's not a deposition outline. Um, <laughs> it, you know, you want to be thinking more along the lines of broader questions that will allow people to really ex explain uh, how they might interact or how maybe they might use this product. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Focus groups. Um, I'm going to actually move a little uh, more quickly through things because I'm realizing that I am. I don't want to take away time from our um, our case studies here. Um, focus groups are, in my mind, generally quicker, um, but often not as good as an interview, especially if you're not very a very skilled facilitator of focus groups. They're they're harder in my mind to do well. Um, so again, you want to write things out, but make it a conversation. Um, groups of about five to eight enough so that if um, 
uh, people cancel, you'll still have a group, but not so many that you've got overwhelming. Um, it's helpful to have group, have exercises or an exercise that the group can do together. Um, you want to think through who you're having in the room so that if you can, to try to avoid having one person or two people that everybody else will defer to in the room because it basically at that point it becomes an interview and <laughs> you've just got a bunch of people sitting in the room for it. Um, and it can be actually tricky to figure out how to, how do you take notes, how do you record it, so make sure you think about that in advance. Dan, I know you mentioned that you'd uh, had some experience here. What, what would you add here? No, just that I wanted to point out with focus groups, I think um, they're most successful if, you have a, if you're working with a wide range of stakeholders and you're going to do focus groups. I would keep or consider at least keeping your focus groups um, to one discipline or one group subgroup of your stakeholders because you really do end up with, you can end up, it's very easy, especially if you've got lawyers and non-lawyers in a focus group, it's very easy for the lawyers to dominate, both because lawyers tend to do that, but also because the other folks around the table, if you're if the point of the focus group has uh, to do with a legal issue, they will often defer sort of automatically. So I have, and when I've used focus groups, we've tended to, you know, we're going to have judges, we're going to have all judges together, and then yeah. we'll have, you know, self-represented litigants separately. Yeah, great. I'm so glad you said that. I was a little worried you were going the opposite direction. No, I 100% agree. Sounds great. Um, and keep in mind that recruiting is often for for all of these things for interviews, focus groups, um, focus groups. Um, in, recruiting may be as hard or harder than actually conducting them. So figuring out where are the people coming from, how do you get them in a room? Um, so it, ideally, if you're doing something relatively short, so you're doing like a short interview go to where the people are already. So basically show up at a, um, I mean, it could be many places. You probably want to go someplace where you have permission to do it, but um, you could go to a, like uh, Rachel had mentioned, a community action agency. Um, and um, uh, just basically see if you can find people who are willing to take 10 minutes or take 20 minutes or even take a half an hour um, to, um, to talk with you or do a user test. Um, Incentives, uh, things like a $10 gift card seem like, so in my experience in, with um, a couple of user tests with this kind of low income population seems to be sufficient, in fact, seems to be popular. Um, and remember in, with your doing appointments in advance that many people will cancel. Um, and you can't, you certainly don't want to do things like double book yourself, um, which would be really unfriendly, um, but remember that, that 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 is a possibility, that you don't want to assume that 100% will be there or you'll get half the people and it will go awry. Rachel, you want to add just something quickly on recruiting? I know that you, you guys gave a lot of thought to recruiting. Yes. Um, so we were uh, very fortunate that um, we had good relationships going in with our uh, test sites. I mean, as you said before, you might want to pick uh, a site where you you know have a good relationship with the staff already um, that will make it easier um, and um, another kind of uh, tip that we had was um, having the staff members who theoretically uh, at least for us at the community action agencies um, the users were already very comfortable with um, and associated them with like receiving um, you know good outcomes um, so when the staff members asked them to participate, I think they were much more comfortable versus me, a stranger in a suit, coming up to them and asking them questions. Um, so that was very effective. Great. Fantastic. Just a couple of um, thoughts about what to do with the data. Um, so you typically, for a, so an in-person or, or all over the phone interview, or a focus group or a user test, so for all of the things that we'll be talking about. Um, you typically take handwritten notes, and then you very soon afterwards uh, try to write it up um, so that you don't lose, like handwritten notes, you tend to forget what they mean very quickly because everything starts to blend together. So you will typically uh, write up the notes, and then you will go through and code them. So like for instance, they will, you'll have a statement and this statement was by this person or this number of per this, this participant number and you'll put codes on it to simply say, all right, well, this one I decree that this one is about lockout 
um, and these three are about lockout. Um, and then I'm just going to like maybe for this particular set of data, I feel like uh, like one category isn't sufficient. I'm going to add another one about not knowing who to call. Um, so I can glom it kind of a different way. And then I can quantify this way. So I can say, all right, 80% of those Ill illegally evicted simply moved on without taking any action. And 36% specifically mentioned that they didn't know who to contact to preserve their rights. So this is completely legitimate data. You know, this is something that is done in academic research all the time. Um, it's time consuming. Um, I generally estimate this at about an hour for each interview hour. So basically a minute per minute on uh, the actual time that it took to, um, to conduct the interview to then analyze it and quantify it. Here's another thing that you could do with this. Um, and, and sometimes you get a lot of, of data that you, um, uh, that it's hard to quantify. You kind of just get a feel for how people are doing things. This is a diagram that's uh, sometimes called a mental model diagram. Um, Rachel is going to actually talk about this specific diagram. And in fact, I noticed she picked a very specific screen, very similar screenshot. Uh, so I'm not going to actually talk you much through this. Uh, but the idea of it is that basically I am uh, documenting the general trends of what people in this particular screenshot are saying that they will, how they use internet research. Um, so they'll quickly scan the page to look at it and see if it looks credible and useful and here's some things about this. Quickly scan to see if the info I need is there. Um, this particular one was actually created based on academic research. Um, so we never actually spoke to anyone for this. We used like five academic uh, pieces of, of research which in total had like 200 interviews. Um, so it, more than that in fact. Um, so it summarized a lot of different research. Another thing to explore further if you have a lot of this kind of data is something called a customer journey map, um, which is another kind of diagram that is the, the term the term is used a lot for a lot of different things. Um, but just in general, it refers to mapping out a process that's either kind of a process in time or in space or both. And then kind of what people are thinking and during, doing during that. Um, so this would be another term to kind of look up if you're thinking about doing diagrams. Um, I find a mental model is easier because it's a bunch of boxes. <laughs> and in fact, you can do something that's pretty journey map-like with just a bunch of boxes. This one tends to look more like this, which kind of requires a little more fancy visual design feel. Questions, thoughts on any of that stuff before we talk about user testing, getting their reaction. Great. All right. So just our kind of quick overview here. So now we're thinking about how does the audience use um, oh, well, here's, here's one that we'll actually look at more in more detail. How does the audience use other people's systems for doing what we're talking about? How do your designs work in real life? How, do, how, are they, uh, how well are they able to understand and use the design? And last, and I would say least, what suggestions do they have to improve the design? Um, and um, so I feel like when you're doing user testing specifically, and this actually becomes a little different, and we'll talk about co-design sessions um, as part of this. A co-design is a little different. Um, user testing, you're generally focused particularly on what it is that they're actually doing um, as they test. Um, and you can think here through uh, testing your site, testing other people's site, testing paper prototypes, um, and co-design sessions, which we'll define. All right, user testing basics. User testing, uh, I would say, is the opposite of surveys. It is much easier to do than people think, and it is harder to go wrong. Um, so it is worth trying. Um, there's definitely, you want to uh, think about what you're doing. Uh, so you want to 
practice a little bit. You want to think through best practices, but there's really no um, there's no harm <laughs> in getting you know actual audience feedback on things. Um, and things, I would say, the earlier the better. Um, so there's no point in designing and building an entire, let's say, website. Um, and then testing it and finding that there's a lot that you would change about it, except you're supposed to launch in two weeks. Like, that's just a waste of testing to me. So you want to try to think through how you can test early in order to get that feedback. So let's see. So four to five people for like a half an hour scenario. Um, so a, generally, a user test is about a half an hour, so it could be less than half an hour. Um, in general, you'll get a lot of the feedback you're going to get. Like, I think they, there's someone, there's a lot of studies here that say actually like 80% of the feedback you're going to get, people can get in four to five people. You want to script out the test carefully. Um, so you want to write down the questions you're going to ask. You want to think through how the flow is going to work. You want to try it out. Um, because especially if you're working with folks who are less internet savvy, uh, there's kind of a power dynamic between you and them. You want to make sure there's not just kind of weird awkwardness in the middle of the test, which is going to throw off the whole dynamic um, and the, the feedback. Um, so you basically ask them to take the computer um, and do what they would do if you weren't there. Um, give them a scenario. And ask them to think out loud. So basically ask them to talk a little bit about why they're doing what they're doing is the general sense. And it's useful to try to give them a real scenario um, all the way to, if you can, asking them to think of a time when what you're doing would have applied to them and they can, you know, come up with the, they can come up with a scenario that they would actually walk through themselves. That's the ideal. I find that it's often tricky. Um, at least give them a scenario that they can kind of put themselves in and uh, kind of play act through. Recruiting may be tricky um, in the same way as everything else. Um, so uh, this is, uh, to my mind, it, it sounds intimidating when I talk through it. But in fact, it is really not that hard. And here is if you Google this, or we can send the link around. Rocket Surgery Made Easy by Steve Krug. Um, this is a book, um, but he has uh, put out a usability demo, um, which is just him on YouTube. It's a, just a video of him doing a user test. You can see how it really is not all that complicated. Rachel, do you want to talk for just 30 seconds or so about um, kind of what you found? <laughs> let's, let's, let's go with the positive side. What you found easier than yeah. you expected about user testing? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I um, you recommended practicing beforehand. Um, so what I did was I practiced with one of my colleagues that I was very comfortable with, and I recorded it and then listened to it later and also took feedback from Laura um, and my colleague. Uh, and that really put me at ease. Um, Especially once I realized that as I got more comfortable in the test, it went much better. And so I was like, oh, well, if I just relax, you know, I don't have anything to worry about. Um, it was also, a, you know, kind of a situation where I was afraid um, that people would ask me questions that I couldn't answer or I wouldn't be able to, you know, inspire confidence in them. Um, and then, you know, I got there and I realized, oh, well, first of all, I've been working on this project for a year and a half, so that's, you know, I am the expert. Uh, and secondly, uh, people really felt like we were um, listening to them. And they we we offered the $10 gift card incentive that we talked about earlier. And just with those two things, people were very um, you know positive towards us. Um, and so I think I was a little intimidated. And I thought people would you know question why I was asking them to do things or kind of give me um, resistance. And um, I think just by relaxing and realizing that, um, you know, not only are they doing me a favor, but I was doing them a favor, it made the whole process a lot more comfortable. Fantastic. Great. Um, and so, uh, so uh, capturing the data, um, so something that people um, often don't think about until too late, 
Um, if you're going to like, so if you're only doing four or five, you can probably just um, uh, understand what the issues are and revise. If you're going to do a larger set, because for instance, you are testing for a bunch of different things, um, then you are a bunch of options compared to each other. You probably want something like a spreadsheet like this to write them up after. So you can see things like what path did they take through the site? comments or issues or good things or bad things, um, et cetera. So different things that you can test. Um, here's another thing that I think that people don't think about nearly as much as they could. Um, there's no reason that you can't test things that other people built. Um, if it is public and it is live on the web, then you test it. <laughs> so, like for instance, this is a screenshot of I think this is Virginia's pro bono portal. Um, if I were, and I just arbitrarily selected that. Um, if I were uh, building a pro bono portal, um, there's no reason that I couldn't test a number of them to understand what works well and what doesn't work well. And this is something that's done in the competitive world. Uh, sorry, in the corporate world all the time. Go. So, Competitive testing. We don't we don't compete in the nonprofit world, so we, we don't do that. Um, but if it's if it's there, it's I mean, it's certainly it's polite to tell people you're doing it. Um, but there's I mean, it's public. So you go go for it. Uh, you can also do paper prototyping. Um, so literally creating a mock-up in paper of what you are thinking. You can see here that there is an interface um, which is designed in paper. This is actually a fairly complicated interface. Um, and ask people to, like, I will, I've done this before where I tell them, you know, all right, I'm giving you this magical clicking stick, which is like a pen. Um, and, you know, it's a tell, them, you know, like basically you just, people tend to be, they, they think it's fun, it's silly. And you actually get a lot of good feedback because it's so obviously not final um, that people are willing to give you feedback. Um, obviously, you can test your own system. Um, so if you are improving an element of it, so test before you plan to refine it to see if there are additional things you can add in or test as you build to validate that people uh, uh, respond as you expect them to respond. Co-design sessions are an interesting thing. They're um, kind of relatively new to the world of, um, of UX. They're kind of a combination of a focus group, a design session, and a user test. Um, and actually, I was going to ask Dan to give his perspective on it. He's a lot more experienced than I. And because we're writing short on time, I'm just going to hand it over to Dan. Dan, can you just talk a little about what a co-design session is? Well, um, um, sure, yeah. Um, it can take so many different forms, really. But uh, the way that we try to deploy it at the New Law Lab is through uh, sort of convening uh, core groups of co-designers, stakeholders, over the course of the lifeline of the um, entire project. So that you start with those folks with the idea ideation and the prototyping and the testing, and you're doing that uh, at regular intervals, um, which is going to not just create the, the you know, iterate the actual um, details of the, or the product specifications, but it can also help transform stakeholders into co-creators uh, who aren't just uh, there with buy-in, but are also have a sort of pride of co-authorship. And that goes a really long way with um, with um, marketing and getting your tool out there. So co-design, you know, at the bottom, it really is working directly with the intended end user uh, in a collaborative way to design the product or service itself. Um, and again, we we deploy it in a lot of different ways and a lot with a lot of variety as well. Um, the way we did it in Connecticut with the game was, you know, through like I said, convening stakeholders, having a game design workshop that was a lot of fun, um, and then reconvening those folks uh, to test the actual um, first iteration, the first beta of the uh, digital game, and then reconvening again when we got another grant to do another game that was focused on eviction, um, and that sort of created sort of this, you know, game design studio, if you will, down in Connecticut. Yeah. Yeah, so they're kind of, if you envision them as a combination of focus group, design session, and user testing. So you're basically creating and testing almost in one. 
Um, you're getting some, I would say that you're not getting as much um, uh, initial kind of feedback as you would get from doing all of those separately. But what you lose in the potential of getting a ton of input for like a design team to think thoughts, you are potentially gaining in buy-in from your stakeholders. Um, so as Dan said, it, I think it's a particularly powerful method for uh, showing people kind of uh, getting people to listen to each other um, and to like to have lawyers in the same room as you know self-represented litigants and to for them to understand each other um, and in thinking through how to build a system. So absolutely, and you'll hear more from Dan and Jim just a second as he talks about. Um, how he's used this for a particular project. All right, so that is our look at a bunch of techniques. Um, questions or thoughts about any of those techniques before we dive into some case studies, um, starting with Ohio Legal Health. You guys are not uh, not uh, quite participating in my my user uh, my user feedback on this webinar, but I hope that it's uh, a useful one for you. Um, fantastic, um, Rachel, uh, take it away. Uh, do you want to actually control the screen, or do you want uh, me to do the slides for you? Um, if you could just do do them for me, I feel like we work together. You know, you can get <laughs> we have a connection there, but um, okay. Yeah, so uh, as I previously mentioned, I oh, okay. uh, work for the Ohio um, Legal Assistance Foundation. Yep, that's perfect. You can, yes. Um, and we are working on Ohio Legal Help, which is our statewide portal project. Um, we have spent about the past year doing um, some research, stakeholder engagement, um, gathering data on our users, and then design work, and um, we are, starting to um, actually get into building the website and implementation um, this summer, and uh, on schedule to have the full launch um, in summer 2019. Um, so I'm gonna go over a couple of steps that we took in our user research um, to kind of get to where we are now. Um, so we started out with a series of surveys on um, the first survey we did was for providers, and as Laura mentioned earlier on the sub, on the survey page, um, when we had a very defined audience of um, you know lawyers in Ohio, judges in Ohio, it was much easier to get um, participant feedback. Um, you know, through our partners, we could send out a email through the Ohio State Bar Association, or we could go to the judges conference. Um, and have kind of captive audiences um, and large enough groups of people that it was reasonable to assume that if you know 10% participated, we would still get usable results. Um, when we moved on to do the voice of consumer survey, um, the recruitment of participants became much more challenging. Um, so what we ended up with was um, 800 respondents. About 90% of those we reached through a um, survey service called Qualtrics. Um, so these were not um, folks that we were able to, um, you know, go to legal aid clinics and get 800 people to respond. That was, um, you know, a method that we tried and pretty quickly realized was not going to be feasible for the number of responses we were looking for. Um, so that is a cost consideration to take into account when you're looking at these, at, you know, that number of respondents. Um, we were able to give some parameters um, for those responses, however, um, because we were going with a commercial uh, survey company, it was, again, much harder to get very low income um, respondents. So we were able to focus in on at least half of the respondents made less than $30,000 a year, um, which was um, you know, obviously much higher than the legal aid um, income uh, limit. So again, as Laura mentioned, not necessarily our ideal target audience. Um, we did get some very uh, useful information um, from them in terms of uh, clarifying people's main 
uh, concerns about um, you know engaging with an attorney or engaging with the court system as a self-represented litigant. Uh, folks reported that um, cost and confusion about the legal system were by far their biggest access access hurdles to justice. Um, and it also helped us identify a couple of strategies to um, think about when we were doing our design. Um, so we wanted to make sure that our website is going to be direct and simple. Um, we want to emphasize, you know, if there are cost saving opportunities, we want to be transparent with people about potential um, costs of, you know, engaging in the court system or hiring an attorney. And we also want to um, make sure people feel secure using our website. That was a big takeaway we got from the Voice of Consumer survey. Um, people indicating um, unease with giving a whole lot of personal information in order to get uh, self-represented uh, resources. So Laura, if you want to move on to the next slide. Um, from there, uh, we took kind of a, a step back to looking at some more national research, um, which again, Laura mentioned, um, she did a great literature review and put together um, a very large diagram that is our mental model um, that captured about five, I think it was five academic studies um, and included in the studies were about 250, 300 qualitative interviews. Um, so our final product maps out the thought process of a person with a legal issue through various stages of resolving that issue. That was one great thing about using the different studies. Um, some of them focused on different elements of that process. So for example, um, the screenshot that I have here and that Laura was showing you earlier um, is all about online research. Um, so for that section, we you know, focused it on three papers that really honed in on the online research aspect versus um, you know, interaction with court staff or some other areas that uh, were also very useful to us, um, but you know, we were able to really capture the specific um, findings in each part of the journey, if that makes sense. Um, from here, we use it to develop our user testing strategy. Um, so one of the um, key findaways from the mental model has to do with um, making sure that your website is credible because people evaluate online resources very quickly. Um, so we wanted to kind of get people's perceptions on um, if the current, uh, you know, not competitor as Laura said, because we don't compete, but um, you know, similar resources that already exist, you know, are appearing credi credible if people um, look at them and see an authoritative resource or if they just see something that is <coughs> You know, giving them conflicting information, making them more confused. Um, and then a kind of final point on the mental model was that um, we've also, uh, since doing our user testing, have been able to share it with a couple of um, audiences, including our steering committee, which is made up of a lot of um, attorneys and judges and people who are in the legal world but maybe don't interact with um, people who are low income and dealing with legal issues or self-represented litigants um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think it was very helpful for them to be able to see this um, represent, representation of the entire process with you know, specific concerns um, and the specific types of thoughts that people have when they're navigating this as a non-lawyer. Um, does anyone have any questions um, on anything I've gone through at this point? All right. Uh, so yeah, moving on. Thanks, Laura. Um, so for our user testing, uh, we conducted 23 user tests of individuals in five different uh, locations across Ohio. Um, we were very uh, mindful in choosing sites that were um, in some urban areas, some rural, and some suburban locations. Um, we tested uh, four websites that are similar to our um, you know, desired end product. Um, we estimate that almost all of our test subjects were at 300% of poverty, poverty or below. Um, we did not ask them their income, but based on the sites where we were testing, which as I previously mentioned, were community action agencies which help um, folks apply for benefits, um, the highest uh, income that could receive any type of benefit um, that those agencies assist with was 300% of poverty. Um, so that's how we've kind of made that estimate. Um, Another note um, is that 
we only received uh, three male testers out of 23. Um, we are not sure, um, you know, how that that demographic skewing happened. Um, and, you know, we were happy to obviously get 23 tests. That was a great outcome. Um, but we did make sure to note that, and we were writing up our findings, that they might not be totally representative of our entire target audience. Um, and also, just a final note, we were primarily testing to evaluate um, the navigation and kind of the high-level design of the websites. We weren't, um, you know, trying to evaluate content or um, look and feel necessarily. Um, we really tried to focus our questions on um, the specific need that we currently have. And then as we build um, and it's getting past our high-level designs, we will go back and do more user testing that will be more specifically focused on things like content or, um, you know, the visual design, things like that. Uh, we did not try to do it all at once, which I think is, uh, you know, a, a best practice that you should follow. Um, and now looking at our logistics, um, we tested in a team of two, my colleague and I, uh, we visited five testing sites and we did that in a work week. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that if you can avoid it. Um, it was a little exhausting, um, but it, it can be done, um, you know, if, if you have to. I think that we've all been there. Um, we tested at sites with uh, walk-in services and high volumes of clients uh, in our tar target demographic, which is low-income Ohioans, um, who arrived at those locations expecting to wait. Um, because they were already expecting to have a wait, most folks didn't really seem to be in a rush, um, at least the folks who agreed to um, do the user test for us. Um, and that, I think, was very helpful in terms of recruitment, um, you know, purposely going to a place where people are expecting to spend time and also acknowledging that um, they would not lose their place in line for services was also very important. We offered folks $10 gift cards. Um, to participate, which seemed to be a good amount. Um, we were at uh, two sites where staff members prearranged some appointments, but as Laura mentioned, we did have a fair number of no-shows, um, and the majority of our participants were recruited um, on the spot by staff. Um, we used two laptops, um, and we recorded our interviews, um, both audio and then had a screen capture. Um, we had the capability to run two tests at once, but we uh, pretty quickly realized that it was um, more helpful to have one person uh, kind of drive and lead the test and have another person taking notes. That way, um, not only could we compare our impressions of uh, the user's experience, but we could also um, you know, focus on good note taking and good facilitation and not try to do two things at once. Um, and so just kind of quickly wrapping up with some takeaways. Um, uh, the When we did the gift cards, uh, we thought to ourselves, oh, well, we should make sure we have a lot of options. So we have grocery stores and, um, you know, donuts or ice cream. You know, we wanted, honestly, we had a little bit of personal ickiness about um, giving a bunch of money to Walmart. Uh, it turns out that that was a barrier to us. Um, people want a Walmart gift card. Um, and I think from that, I've we, we kind of learned not to be so... Uh, you know, squeamish about it, um, and also realizing that when we asked um, some of the staff members at those sites about local grocery stores, they would give us um, stores that were accessible to them, but were not accessible to their client base based on transportation especially. Um, so we would be told, you know, oh, we have X grocery store in Cleveland, but X grocery store is actually only in the suburbs of Cleveland, and it's totally useless to people who live in inner city Cleveland. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we enlisted staff to help us with recruitment, which was very helpful. Um, I also mentioned this earlier that um, having a warm opening line was uh, very helpful, thinking about um, you know, things like where you're from that's maybe not so uh, laden with like a power dynamic um, is something I would recommend. Um, each one of us, we had two different scenarios we were testing. So my colleague and I both only tested one scenario. Um, so, like, I had scenario A every time I was the test, I was leading the test. Um, and that was also very helpful when we were trying to um, document and think about, oh, no, I remember this person said this. I know that it must have been on this day because I was, um, you know, we were in 
X room and I was running this test, so I know it was the scenario. Um, and that was very helpful as well. Um, as Laura mentioned, uh, record your notes right away because you will forget things. Um, you'll look at your handwritten notes and it won't mean anything. Um, uh, the second to last point I have is watch yourself. Um, so especially when you're thinking about uh, legal issues, um, and on one hand, I think I was a little lucky in that I'm not an attorney, um, so I did not necessarily feel um, as much of an impulse to correct folks um, when they maybe found the wrong information to solve their hypothetical legal problem. Um, my colleague's an attorney, and I think it was a little bit harder for her to not um, kind of step in and correct and interfere with the test a little bit. Um, so just keep that in mind to watch um, kind of your impulses and the biases that you might have going in. Um, and then finally, uh, it's kind of a, a self-care note to uh, give yourself a break. So we went five days straight and we did 23 user tests, so that averaged, um, you know, about five a day. Um, and we would do those five just right in a row, um, mostly because we didn't want to burden our test uh, sites with, oh, well, we need people, but we don't need people, you know, we need a break. You know, we didn't want to do that to the staff. Um, but in retrospect, um, if we had had a little more mindful scheduling, we probably would have been a little bit uh, fresher and maybe done a better job for some of those later user tests. Um, because it is, it's, as we mentioned, it's not incredibly difficult, but it is a bit draining to, um, you know, be on for a few hours straight. Um, so yeah, that is kind of my um, experience um, implementing a user test as a non-user testing expert. Um, does anyone have any questions uh, before I hand it over to Dan? Just to mention, so both Rachel and Dan's case studies, um, I've picked not necessarily because they are small. This is not what I would call a small shoestring user test. Um, which is more like four or five users, as I mentioned, but because I think they're super applicable and all of the things uh, will still apply. The same is true of Dan. Great. Sure. I will turn it over to Dan. Dan, all you want right. to talk? Huh? Um, I'll just talk for a couple of minutes about um, paper prototyping and in particular uh, show you some examples of a truly on a shoestring, uh, very much how much of a shoestring it can be. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, we are dry, uh, drawing these um, photographs and these examples from uh, a project we have where we're partnered with uh, IELTS Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System and Stanford's Legal Design Lab on a uh, project called Court Compass, which is a multi-state effort to simplify and streamline uh, uncontested divorce. So far, we've been working in Massachusetts and Iowa. This project is actually a follow-on to the Cases Without Counsel uh, study that uh, Laura mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, and so we have been going around, uh, but at least in Massachusetts and Iowa, convening a diverse group of stakeholders, thank you, perfect, uh, for day-long design workshops um, where we are, it's, this is a good example of a co-design approach where we go from the very beginning to the end of the design process in just one day with folks. Um, paper prototypes are a key aspect of the workshop that we've been doing, um, and basically the table teams that we have uh, are able to then test their ideas with other tables by having folks interact with these paper prototypes. So go to the next slide, I'll show you an example of one. This is a mobile app, paper prototype, right? The, the folks at one table just sort of took some paper and ripped it up into uh, basically handheld phone size stacks of paper. And then they uh, detailed exactly what each, each screen would have and were able to then hand it over to folks uh, to test um, and flip through as if they were interacting with a smartphone. Um, and go to the next one, please. And this is an example of a website paper, paper prototype. Again, the same design workshop, but this was done on large format um, uh, easel uh, paper uh, and using stickies and post-its. Uh, again, people would go up to this. Uh, the first thing they see, divorce prime. Would you like a divorce? Yes, no. And they flip the page, go on to the next question, go on to the next question. So it can be really, I mean, you can really get a lot of helpful uh, feedback and testing done very, very early in the process with nothing more than a marker and some paper. I think people sometimes, if we're uh, creating digital tools, you think, well, shouldn't this, shouldn't the prototype be the something that you actually a digital uh, aspect of it that they can actually interact with? Um, uh, but no, you can, uh, people are really, really familiar at this point with the uh, uh, basic look and feel of our mobile phones and websites, and it's really easy to just sort of 
jump into the uh, the details of your particular design by just sketching it out on paper and having people interact with it. I will say that you know as you're doing that, if you're doing it in a design workshop, uh, like we were doing it in Iowa there, um, and you're working with non-designers as your co-designers, you have to be really, really uh, hard on them not to explain their prototype. You you know the designer stands there and wants to say no, now you got to do this, now you got to that, and don't forget to do this. No, you got to keep your mouth zipped. Um, and let the other team, the other group of people actually interact with the paper prototype as if they were encountering the digital tool uh, without the designer standing there. Um, and the last thing I want to mention, I would be remiss if I didn't, this is from our game represent with Statewide Legal Services of Connecticut. And this was, we created large format um, sort of uh, examples of the game, the scenarios that the, or the scenes, if you will, that were available for the game designers to use, and then just the cutouts of the people. We use this to design the, uh, or to come up with the scenarios for Represent Renter, which is the second of the two games. Uh, we brought these to our co-design sessions down in Connecticut and up in Maine, um, and had people play with these as they thought about what the characters might do in the game and thought about how the uh, characters would interact with each other. It was more of a play tool in a way, really, than a paper prototype per se, because it's not a testing, uh, not sort of a testing function, more of a, a design process function. Um, and it's all, it's very playful, it's kind of fun. And so we've got those here in the lab and we use them whenever we are uh, sitting down and beginning the process of thinking about using that platform for another purpose. And I just encourage people to uh, be as creative and fun as, and quick and down and dirty as you can with paper prototyping because you can just hammer out those ideas, get some immediate very quick feedback and then pivot to uh, to wherever you want to go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. Yeah, I would echo paper prototyping is a fantastic technique that not enough people use, I think. And thank you. Thanks to Dan's uh, particularly whirlwind tour through his own case study. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> um, <I was laughs> yeah. Making note of the time there. So. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I apologize for pushing you to the end. Um, we've got, we'd love any questions you have. So you've got, you know, three people with a fair amount of expertise here to, um, to take on kind of questions you have or thoughts you have. Um, what do you, what questions do you have? Or, um, sorry, do you have anything to, to ask the, the group? So I will, um, I'll ask uh, Dan and Rachel a question. Um, so maybe I would say, uh, so for those folks who are thinking about getting started, um, so they haven't done a lot um, and all of it, and we've just presented like 19 different things that they could do. Um, where would you encourage them to potentially start? Can we narrow down to, you know, just a finite number of things that we think might be a, a good place to, to start experimenting? Oh boy, that's a, that's a tough question for me to answer without. Yeah, with, I mean, again, I, I hate to say it, it sounds like a, a, a classic lawyer by saying it always depends on the problem you're trying to solve. But um, I think research is actually a really uh, helpful way to get started. There's a lot of study, you know, academics. I'm here on a university campus. I can tell you, academics like to write papers, and um, and they spend a fair amount of time thinking about issues, thinking through issues. That's a great way to start to frame out the problem that you're hoping to address um, and it can be a you know a place where you will start to identify okay well this has been done before that has not been done before here's the opportunity path um, mm -hmm. and that's you know academic research is a good place to start and no one's probably going to tell you to stop you know no one's going to say no don't do that don't go read academic papers so well, you don't want to go too far, right? You don't want to, you're not doing a lot of your article, so you don't want to uh, research all the way down to the Magna Carta and back again. But you, know, <laughs> you can you can get a good environmental scan of what the state of the play is, uh, the state of art. In, in yeah, yeah, and I play. might, if I'm answering my own question, I might say go talk to anybody in your target audience about anything. Um, so plan out what you're going to ask them, um, and go someplace where people are and sit down and talk to four people about their own experiences. Just because I feel like meeting the actual people that you're serving can have a really powerful impact almost beyond what you are actually creating. Yeah, I would echo that, Laura. As, 
as someone who works in an office that doesn't provide direct services, um, that was an incredibly important part of my user testing experience. Um, just the, the, you know, the few brief kind of introductory questions we did before we got into using the sites um, was very, uh, not only, um, I think, technically useful, but also kind of uh, grounded me in, um, you know, who I'm building this for. And I think that that's kind of an invaluable experience. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's, oh, oh, fantastic. Go for it. Huh. Um, so, I mean, how often is basically as, as often, so you'd ideally have been testing incrementally as you build it, and then every time you do a change to it, you would test it. So, I mean, ideally, I mean, I could do nothing but test. Um, I think realistically, it's a really hard question because there's so little that's been done. Um, I, what I would like to say is realistically you don't need to test every little thing because you can assume that your site is going to work like other legal aid sites or other legal uh, help sites for most things, but that doesn't help you because nobody has tested anything um, or so few people have tested anything. Um, so I, I would start with, I mean, do, do as much as you can. Um, so we, I am um, in charge of research at Florida, and the Florida Justice Technology Center. Um, and we are, we've just set a goal for ourselves to do two serious um, uh, outreach um, studies for, um, per year. So, and I think that that is, right, so and that's about 20 user tests Per, so we could also split that up. So that'd be about 40 user tests per year is what we've just set ourselves as a stretch goal at, in Florida. We could So we could also do a full session on active A-B testing, um, putting together design processes so that you are testing live iteratively as you roll out new resources. Yeah, that's a great point as well. So basically- It, it doesn't have to be a separate thing. Better than that, yeah. Great, what are the questions we have? Um, I, I mean, one of these here is what What would be kind of your recommendations on um, most relevant few articles from the last two or three years? If somebody was gonna go read a article on this, what would you recommend? So um, relevant research or relevant well, about- research. Because you just suggested, hey, start with a literature review, uh, look at the research, what article would you recommend? Well, I will take the easy path um, and say, so I've just posted to LSN TAP the mental model that Rachel described, and that summarized five different national studies, well, four national studies and one Canadian study. Um, and that's, I think, where I would recommend, recommend starting. They're all, four, five of them are studies of kind of how self-represented litigants think about information to help themselves. Um, that, was, that was posted to our email list. We'll grab that and put it into the blog summary of this particular uh, webinar as we post the video. Yeah, great. Other questions or do we need to wrap up right on the hour? Um, so there was a question which is the lit review from Ohio and I, I assume that is what part of that was. Okay, excellent. Perfect. Yep. Yep. So that that posted. We also just recently posted and can repost I can send around again um, the full uh, report from the user uh, research that uh, that um, Rachel mentioned, which among other things had I mean it has the results, but it also has the entire methodology. It has exactly what we did in the entire guide for it in it. Um, so there, there was an interesting question about how, um, how can government agencies use gift card um, ideas for participation? It seems like uh, not doing so because of using uh, public funds. Uh, my, my quick answer on that is that uh, compensating people for um, participation in an activity, I, I'm not familiar with any uh, restriction there. Uh, the restrictions that I'm aware of come into things like competitively bidding contracts at a certain 
uh, size, that type of stuff. But a nominal compensation is extremely common in the legal services industry for uh, giving for people who are giving their time to really improve these resources. And I no. feel like Rachel, you guys thought a little about that. Yeah, do you know any answer to that question? Um, so we didn't really get into it. Oh, we did have uh, a testing site at a court self help center, um, and our our office, which is a non governmental organization, was offering the gift card with you know within the context of the court, and um, the court didn't seem to have an issue with that. Um, but I, you know, I think it probably uh, may depend on your individual, um, you know, administration. Yeah, that makes sense. What else do we have, Brian? Um, I think that's a, I think that covers everything. We've had a very interactive session today. We're going to have that summary up and then the entire webinar will be available on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, thank you so much for putting this together today. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, both to Dan Jackson and to Rachel Harris, and then to Laura Quinn for putting this together. It's been a wonderful session. Thanks for having me. And thanks everybody for coming. Thank you to Dan and Rachel. Uh, and I hope to, um, to see you at another seminar soon.